So I'm going to be talking about porting 64-bit Risk Five for Linux um, to well, ROS to target that. So first, I'll briefly touch on what Rust is, then talk a little bit about Rust's compiler. Um, then we'll look at the pull request adding support for Rust's compiler, Rust for Risk Five to Rust compiler, and some other little bits. Then the main bit of the talk is working through a bug that I fixed it for some tests, and then we'll finish looking at Risk Five support in the wider Rust ecosystem. So Rust is a modern programming language targeting everything from microcontrollers all the way up to WebAssembly and data centers and stuff. Um, it's no runtime or garbage collector or anything, compiles to native code, so it's similar performance to C or C++. The sort of distinctive thing about Rust is the reliability. So there's the famous borrow checker, where so you can only have one one place in your code that's mutating a variable if it's mutable and you can only read from that place but if a variable is immutable then you can read it from all over so basically it comes down to there's no shared immutable state allowed um, and then also there's the lifetimes so the time that memory is initialized is tracked all the way from initialization to freeing or the stack frame going away or whatever. So you can't have a use after free or anything like that in Rust because it's enforced at compile time. And Rust also finally aims to be productive. So the error messages are really good. You'll be seeing a lot of them. Um, good documentation, good tooling, and it can speak to C libraries. So Rust C is Rust's compiler. Normally you'd use Cargo, which is sort of like Make or NPM, but for Rust. So it will can build your program, it can run unit tests, it can download dependencies, that sort of thing. So Rust C uses LLVM as the compiler backend. So LLVM is a modular compiler backend. It's a backend for lots of compilers. So Clang, BCC, Rust, that sort of, many others. So the, what a compiler backend in this case, so LLVM, you give it LLVM IR intermediate representation, which is, uh, it look, if you squint, it looks a bit like assembly, but you have unlimited registers and some amount of data typing going on. And importantly, it's machine independent. Then LLVM looks at that and optimizes it and produces the machine code for the particular target you want. So this means that all the really difficult machine dependent things are handled inside LLVM and there isn't a huge amount of work for Rust to do to support a new target. So we'll see that in a minute. First, just a little quirk um, I thought was interesting for Rust C is it's moving towards an unusual control flow design where the whole process of compiling some source is modeled as a graph of memorizable queries. So if you imagine you might invoke Rust C and tell it to build a particular Rust module, that would then generate a query that says get machine code for this module, which would then depend on a query that would say run LLVM on some IR for this module, and that will produce the machine code, which would then, of course, would depend on the query to get the LLVM intermediate representation. And then that will go through various representations inside Rust, and eventually there'll be a query that says pass the source code. Um, so that covers the whole process. There's also queries for smaller things. So that you might have a query that says, get the type for this symbol in this context. And then the advantage of these queries is that because they're memoizable, that means that once the query has been executed once, the compiler can remember what the result of that query was in memory. So you're only getting the type for that symbol in that context once, but then that really comes into its own in incremental compilation. So if you imagine you build your Rust program and then make a small change and then build it again, you want the second time to reuse as much as possible from the first time you ran the e compiler. So just to speed things up so you can develop nice and quickly, and this really comes into its own with IDE tooling. 
Um, so the perfect case for this would be if you build build your program and then edit a comment that isn't a documentation comment and then build it again. The query to get the abstract syntax tracer to pass it will still run, but then it'll produce in theory the same syntax tree as the previous run because you haven't actually changed anything substantial in the code, you only changed a comment. So then everything after that would could just be served from disk in theory. So it would be really, really quick to rerun. So back to the porting. This is the entire pull request that added the 64-bit RISC-V unknown Linux target. So on the left, I couldn't quite fit all the patch context in, but what's happening off the screen is there's a macro invocation and it's fed all a tuple for each supported target. So the tuples have, so the first element is a string that's just the string that you pass as the target to Rust C when you're invoking it to tell it, um, to, to tell it which target you want. And then the right hand side is the module that tells Rust how to use that target. So on the right hand side of the screen, we have the implementation of that module for 64-bit risk 5 um, So it's a function called target that returns a result that's always okay, that which has, contains a structure. And in that structure, we have everything that the compiler needs to know to build things to that target. So it just needs to, at the top, we have the string that you give to LLVM to tell LLVM to generate machine code for this target. And there's various things like the endianness and pointer sizes, that sort of thing. And then a data type layout, um, inheriting things from other general Linux base. But important for us here are the features. So the cool th one of the cool things about RISC-V is it's a modular instruction set. Instruction set. So RISC-V base instruction set is very, very minimal. It's a very, very small microcontroller sort of thing. And then everything else is a little extension. So here we have the M for multiply and divide instructions, A for atomic instructions, F, and D for single and double precision floating point, and C for compressed instructions. We'll come back to those later. So the little niggles, so what wasn't quite, what you couldn't see on that um, pull request because it was already in Rust, is the ABI support. So ABI, or Application Binary Interface, says how different machine code units interoperate together. So it covers stuff like system core conventions and Oh, hang on. Is that better? Okay, I don't know what happened there. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Oh, that's possible, yeah. I'll move that. I'll move my phone further away. Okay, so... Um, yeah, sorry, I should have thought of that. So yeah, the ABIs we have, how machine machine code units talk to each other. Um, so, so the bit that we're interested in here is the function calling convention. So that tells you things like, are you passing function arguments on the stack? Are you passing them in registers? If you're passing a struct to a function, how does that, how does that map to registers? Does how do you pack it? That sort of thing. do you put it on does the struct on the stack? There's questions like that. And like I said with LLVM IR, it if you squint it looks a bit like assembly. So it's just a bit too low level to capture things like the function calling convention. So Rust also needs to know how to do that. And that wasn't shown on the previous PR because it was already there. So the, the but LLVM still sort of solved the problem because there's other compilers using LLVM that are solving basically the same problem. It turned out Clang already had support for 
64 bit RISC client Linux. So we could, um, if you read the Rust implementation and the Clang implementation, they're almost exactly the same, um, just in different languages and adapted for the compiler. Um, and that even goes to the tests. And that came in really useful for me because it turned out that I, um, that what, well, there was some code generation tests that were looking at the IR output by Rust. Um, and those started failing part with them at work. So I tracked it down and it turned out it was due to the LLVM 10 upgrade. So I was wondering what was going on. So I was able to look at what changed in Clang between Clang 9 and Clang 10. And we could see that there were changes to the tests that explained what was going on. And it was just that LLVM changed how it was printing the um, IR. So then I was able to make the same changes to Rust's test. Um, and everything was everything was fine. So now the main part of the talk where we talk about a um, hopefully interesting bug I fixed. So Rust Lang Rust is a big GitHub repository that contains the Rust compiler, the Rust standard library, various tools and tests and documentation and all sorts. So one of those classes of tests that are on there are user interface tests which check that everything that the compiler that you notice when you're using the compiler stays the same between compiler versions. So for example, you'll have any compiler warnings or compiler errors show up there. Um, so you have, so what the tests look sort of like, normally you'll have some source code that has a bug in it and that's fed to the compiler. And then the text that the compiler generates complaining about that is captured and is a diff is generated between that and what was expected. So when I tried this for RISC-V 64 bit Linux, um, there were several that failed. And what was strange was they were all to do with unbound variables in match expressions. Now, if you're not familiar with Rust, a match expression is sort of like a switch case statement in C. So in a case statement in C, you're switching on a integral value and then the case that you're matching again, the, the case is some literal integer value. And if there has that value, control will take that branch. In a Rust match expression, it's sort of an elaborated version of that. So you could do that, but then you could also match something based on the rough shape of it. So you could say, you could switch on a tuple and say that you have your match arm be, well, if the left side of the two-way tuple is one, then we'll go into this arm and we might use the right hand side for something or we might not. So the errors on unbound variables would mean that you had some that didn't make sense in that context. So say you were matching on a three-way tuple and you only gave it two. So um, anyway, if you, whether or not you follow that isn't important. The, the bit that I want to sort of get home is it's to do with these variables and it's nothing to do with RISC-V and it's a mile away from anything machine dependent in the compiler. Um, so I was looking, so anyway, I was looking at these tests and they didn't have anything to do with RISC-V and they're actually, they're actually giving the right error messages, but they're in the wrong order and only on RISC-V. So this was very weird. So the, to explain this, I'm gonna to need to take a digression into a little optimization in Rust-C. So if you imagine you're parsing some source code, you're, yeah, you have your source code that you've written and then you want to turn it into an abstract syntax tree, which would look something like if you imagine you had an expression that was A plus B, you'd have a plus node, that maybe that'd be an operation or something marked plus, but it'd be, you'd have some sort of node that represents that there's a plus going on. And then you'd have one branch off saying that the left-hand side of that operation is a symbol called A. And you'd have another branch off the plus saying that the right hand side is a symbol called B. And if you imagine you're producing one of these for some, some source code, there's going to be a lot of repeated strings in there. So like you don't just use a symbol once often. So you might declare a variable and then use it several times. So then you've got the same string used over and over again. And then with Rust, it doesn't it doesn't start editing these strings as it goes along because then your error messages wouldn't make sense. You want it to still be calling your variable called A, still call it A. So you've got all these strings that are repeated and immutable. The obvious thing is to have one copy of them and then lots of references. So that's what we're doing here. Have a, 
every time we want a new string, we allocate it into this table of strings, and then we reference them by the index of the string in that table. So say we wanted to allocate a new string that was lowercase b. That's already in the table at index four. So then we would just say, yeah, we've got that and it's index four and everywhere we would have used that string, we'll just use four. If you wanted to allocate lowercase d, that isn't in the table. So then that will get added to the end after c. So that it would have index six. Uh, so another point here is strings are never freed from this table. So if you imagine what the compiler is doing, it passes some source code into a representation of the source code, and then it works through various representations and it's done. So it's going to need these strings for as nearly as long as the compiler is running. So there's no point worrying about um, ever freeing them. And the zone effect of that is that the indices as new things are allocated is always are always increasing so you add d to the end of the table and it's going to have a higher index than anything already in the table so the order of things in the table reflects the order in which the strings are allocated but i mean what does this have to do with the errors that are in the wrong order well it turned out the error messages were sorted by the variable name that they were complaining about but they weren't sorted by the variable name as a string. They were sorted by the index of the string in that intern string table. And as we said, the ind indices reflect the order in which the strings are allocated. So for some reason on risk five, the strings are allocated in a different order. But why would that happen? Because it's still passing the same source code, what's going on? So I had a look some more and it isn't just the source code strings from there that are interned the compiler will also allocate strings it's just using internally for example processor extensions so as we said before risk five extensions are called things like a c d etc the re where uh, so and can you guess what the variable names were called in the tests a b c d e so it, there's a the strings used in the tests um had already been that were allocated very early on as extension names before it even um started passing the source so it, so but not all not every lower case letter is a risk five extension so b is a draft extension for bitwise operations, but it isn't used in the RISC-V 64-bit Linux target currently. So we're going to say that isn't a RISC-V extension for now. But A and C are. So if you imagine you declared the variables A, B, C on not RISC-V, that those would end up in the table as A is less than B is less than C. But on RISC-V, A and C are extension names. They're going to end up really early in the table and B is only going to come in way later. Um, when you eventually get around to allocating it. So, as I said, the test use these single letter variable names and they're out of order only on risk five because of extensions. So it was really easy to fix this once I'd figured that out, just one line change to sort by the actual string instead of just the index of the string in the table. So did everyone, any questions on that? No, okay, I'll I'll carry on then. So if you want to run the test yourself, you clone the big Rust line Rust repository. Then there's already a Docker container that'll run the tests for you. You can run it like that, as on the slide. If you don't like Docker, um, you can run it yourself to look at the documentation. So the way it, it works is there's a remote remote test server and a remote test client, which are little tools in the big repo. Remote test server runs, so say you have a RISC-V dev board and you want to try the test on that, you could run Rust remote test server on your on Linux on your RISC-V dev board. And then when the, when the compiler build system wants to run a test, remote test client will send the test over to remote test server on your RISC-V machine. And that will then run the test 
and then send the result back. So, so it'll get up from standard error, standard out, and the return code. And this is really useful because um, it takes ages to build LLVM and a while to build Rust. So you really don't want to be doing that on your RISC-V dev board at the, with, with the ones that I've seen currently available. Um, so it's nice that you can do that on your fast machine and then send them over to the dev board. And this works for other architectures too. And that's actually how the Docker container works. So it runs the RISC-V tests on the QMU. So now we'll look at 64-bit um, RISC-V Linux support in the wider Rust ecosystem. So as far as the Rust project's concerned, there's three support tiers. Um, tier three is where RISC-V RISC Linux was when I started. So that means that there's no official builds, no testing. It probably worked for some old ones, but you're on your own. Tier two platforms are guaranteed to build. So there's whenever a pull request is made for Rust Lang Rust, it the check that it, the all the target all the tier two and tier one targets can be built um, for for that pull for with that pull request. So in theory, at any one time, Rust Lang Rust will always build for a tier two target, but there's no automated testing. And then tier one targets, there aren't many of those. The tests are run for every pull request. So that's quite strict. And of course, there's official binaries for um, tier one and tier two targets. I found that in practice, there's two sorts of tier two targets. So there's tier two for cross compilation, which so that would mean that the standard library would be built for that target to the extent that it works. And there'd be enough of LLVM that you could do code generation for that target. But you couldn't actually, they wouldn't actually build Rust C itself for the target. But then, sort of, a higher bar of entry is tier two host support. So that would they actually build the compiler and all the tools and provide official binaries for that target. And that's where RISC V 64 bit Linux is now. So now you have your official binaries for running Rust on RISC V Linux, you'd want to install those. So you'd use Rustup is the Rust installer, um, and it covers like Rust C, Cargo, any other tool you want, documentation, standard library, that sort of thing. Um, normally people do use Rustup rather than distribution tool chains. But I think Debian does have Rust now on Unstable if you want to do that. So Rustup itself didn't need much changing. Um, it just does a uname and then needs to know how to translate that into the target name that Rust uses. But it has a really wide dependency graph. So, if, so these dependencies in Rust are called crates and a few of those needed fixing, um, but it wasn't anything major. It's more bumping version numbers than anything else. Um, and so with that, you can store the binaries, which we'll see later. And then finally, a cool tool I discovered is Cross. So you can install it with Cargo. If you create a new Rust project, so Cargo New just does all the boilerplate for a new Rust program and creates a Hello World project. Um, so Cross wraps around Cargo. So build, run, and test are normal Cargo subcommands that would be familiar to a Rust developer. Cross means that it does the build inside a Docker, Docker container that's set up for that cross compilation. Um, and then run and test will run using QMU user emulation, again, in a Docker container that's set up to have QMU configured right. Um, although you will need bin format support in your kernel. Um, and that makes it really easy to try out cross compilation for risk five without you having to set it. If you want to set up your machine and install the, all the cross compilers you need and configure everything yourself, then you can do that with cargo, but cross makes it really easy. So that's everything. Um, on the left, we have partial output from rust up running inside Debian unstable on a QMU risk five machine. 
and that's showing that we're installing the current stable Rust toolchain with the default selection. And then on the right, um, we have the Rust up magic you need just to install the cross compiler if you don't want to use cross. Although well, I think you also need to see cross compiler too. So um, with that, does anyone have any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. Uh, very nice to hear from you. And uh, fascinating to hear um, you know, the progress that's been made with Rust. And as I mentioned in the chat earlier, it is a subject that's come up in some of the uh, Risk Five uh, task group discussion uh, mailing lists. Uh, so good to know that you're on top of it. Uh, any questions? If anyone would like to ask a question, if you're actively joined, just unmute and speak. If you're um, just in listen mode, type it in the chat and we'll pick it up from there. And I should say, ah, there we are. Question from George. If you can see um, those questions, Tom. So far as I know, everything that Pure Rust does just work. Um, obviously, I haven't tried everything, but it should do. Um, Rust has already supports lots of architectures, the kind of like weird bugs you'd expect. Uh, mostly, sh should work. It should work. Uh, and Debian are building their Rust packages for Risk Five, so they will will spotted things. As for things that do C libraries, it depends on the C library. I don't know what proportion of the cargo library has been compiled. Um, as I said, De Debian packages are cross compiled for that now, but I don't know how good their coverage is. This isn't, the, the Rust project has a cool bot that will scan all of crates.io, which is like the collection of all Rust, open source Rust libraries and build all of them to test the compiler change. But because it's only tier two and there isn't anyone from the core Rust project involved, we haven't been able to have the infrastructure time to try running that. Um, test failures, yes, I saw some, I fixed some, I fixed everything. It worked last time I tried it, but as I said, there isn't, the tests aren't run on every new pull request, so it could it, it could break it between they could be broken between when I notice. Um, I haven't tried real hardware. I didn't have any available. Um, hopefully, we'll have some real hardware at Code Think soon, and then I'll be able to find out. But yeah, at the moment, I am counting on QMU doing the right thing and LLVM doing the right thing. Any more questions? Uh, Tom, thank you. Really interesting talk. Really appreciate it. The talks will appear on our YouTube, on the BCS Open Source Specialist Group YouTube channel, and I suspect also on a Risk Five channel. Though the the whole setup of how Risk Five does that sort of thing has been uh, changing recently. Um, it'll certainly be on the BCS channel, and if I know Julian, it'll be on the BCS channel tomorrow. Um, so thank you very much. I should say that. Um, we 